welcome everybody and our guests wherever you are. I guess to Tampa General. No, let me explain. Um, um, yeah, it's clear. You guys are nowhere. Oh. <laughs> GME, as former pro writer director, you know, GME, yeah. we do what GME tells us to do. Uh, okay. They uh, found out that uh, fellows were coming, like TJH fellows were coming to the VA oh, yeah. conference and they wanted them to stay at their affiliated site. For okay. Purposes. Good. So TJH fellows are at Clementine Davis right now. Okay. So they're there, but Good. They're virtually. All right. Um, and then VA fellows are with us now, and then Moffitt fellows are not. Okay. That's so Moffitt and TJH fellows, you can uh, close your eyes, rest if you need to. I can't see you. Um, <laughs> and we're going to talk about HIV in older patients. And although the title on your slide said geriatric HIV, because of the way they define geriatric mm -hmm. patients, I decided to just call them older um for my own self ego protection <laughs> so um when we look at um older hiv patients one of the things that really is important for us to understand is life expectancy for our hiv patients is at or sometimes even better than some of their age match cohorts um hiv no longer is what's going to kill most people they're going to be dying from comorbidities related to aging some of which get exacerbated because of their HIV disease and the treatment that we give them. Um, unfortunately, because we do so much of the care for our patients, we more and more become responsible for the rest of that management as well. So many of our graduates, when they go into practice and um, specialize in HIV, are doing HIV and HIV primary care, managing the entirety of things. So being aware of how to manage these things, and especially the nuances that complicate HIV care is important. Um, if you look at the total number of people carrying an HIV diagnosis, um, this is US-based data, um, you can see that the majority now fall into our older population. So the population of 50 plus is what we consider um, Keep talking under is what we consider older HIV patients, and those are the bulk of our patients. Now. Um, I don't know as much about what the health department demographics look like now, but here at the VA, if we saw someone under 50 in our HIV, many of them are 65. I think we have 85 year old HIV patients. And Dr. Pardo has done such a successful job managing her old patients <laughs> that they're uh, living into um, infinity. So, um, but this is really what we're dealing with. Um, remember that some of these patients also have acquired comorbidities related to older HIV treatments. They may have renal disease, bone disease that might be more dramatic than you see in your younger patients because of the therapies we gave. As well, many of them also may have been taking medications that increased cardiovascular morbidity. Um, there were a lot more lipid toxic and other medications um, 10, 15 years ago, and they're carrying those risks with them as they move. Forward. Now, when we look at new diagnoses, new diagnoses for HIV still tend to be shifted to the younger generation. About um, the 25 to 29 year old age group is where we see the peak but it is not exclusively among young individuals that we see new diagnoses. And there's still um, about 6,000 cases a year in the plus 50 age group that are newly diagnosed with HIV. Some of those will be newly acquired. Some of those will be not diagnosed previously. Um, the things that we try to do to address that are broader and broader testing strategies. So the reason we have test and treat strategies is to link people to care more appropriately. The reason that if you um, have sniffles and go to the ER at Tampa General, that you're going to get a hep C and HIV test is to identify more and more people and link them to care as appropriate. And that's where we're catching some of these older diagnoses. Um, I also teach geriatrics in our PA program. And when you look at frequency of new sexual encounters based on age, um, in people that aren't already in monogamous relationships, age 65 plus, still about a new sexual encounter um, with one or two more partners on a yearly basis, and up to 85 years old, still people engaging in new sexual activity 
once or twice a year. So all of those patients are at risk. The education they have about risk factor mitigation is less. And so always be on the lookout for that as well. Um, when we look at aging in um, HIV patients, um, we try to distinguish between um, accelerated aging versus attenuated aging in our patients. So when we talk about um, accelerated aging, what we mean is that comorbid conditions that could affect anyone, whether that be cardiovascular disease, cancer, et cetera, affect HIV infected individuals earlier. So when they have that comorbidity, it carries with them longer and their aging is accelerated because of that. And that's true regardless of whether we're controlling their immune system with um, antiretrovirals or not. In the accentuated hypothesis, what we see is that even instead of accelerating that aging, if we just look at the frequency of comorbidities on age match controls, we also see that HIV patients have more comorbidities at each age. Some of that can be related to um, social factors. In HIV patients, there is a greater degree of tobacco abuse than in the general population. There's a slightly higher rate of alcohol abuse. There's greater comorbid drug abuse as well. And all of those also add to accentuating the risk. So the immune dysregulation from HIV accelerates aging and the risk factors that are associated with HIV acquisition accentuate aging. And together, we're significantly increasing the risk of those patients having age-related complications. If we look at um, an HIV population, this tries to demonstrate both of those. So you can see by the disease frequency for any group, an HIV population will have more disease at the same age and earlier disease at the same age. And that's what we'll expect to see then in our populations as well. You guys know what a CD4 count is? Great. All right. So um, in our older populations, remember that their CD4 count recovery is less robust than in younger populations. Because of that, they may be at greater risk for immune-related diseases. They may be more at risk for needing OI prophylaxis for a longer period of time. And because the immune system also plays a role in things like cancer regulation, the lower CD4 counts may place them at a higher risk for emergence of malignant disease. This is, again, one of the reasons we try to catch people with diagnosis in that early part of the age curve, because the earlier we treat, the more robust their CD4 count recovery can be, and the less likely they are going to then carry these long-term risks. This is a graph at the time of initial diagnosis of patients who have what we would define as stage, they say stage three in the y-axis, but it's really looking at stage four HIV, a CD4 count less than 200 at the time of initial diagnosis. This is much more likely in our older population, much less likely in the younger population. Two reasons for that could be true. One is age-related CD4 count decline in general, and the second could be the older population in many cases has carried the diagnosis longer before they got their initial diagnosis, and both of those compound things. Good news about our older population. It is much more likely that our older HIV patients are aware of their diagnosis. And if you look at population estimates, it is estimated that of the 55 plus age group, 90% of people who have an HIV diagnosis are aware of it. Um, now that doesn't mean 
they've been diagnosed and no one told them. That means 90% of people who have HIV have been tested and made aware. 10% have it and have not yet accessed testing to be aware of that diagnosis. So the same thing is shown here. Um, and in fact, even more encouraging with slightly later data, in the youngest age group, just a little more than half of people who are HIV infected are aware, all the way up to 95% when you get older and older. So overall, we are doing, a, I think, a pretty good job with HIV diagnosis and awareness. 86% of the population in the country, if they are infected, is aware of the diagnosis. And bridging that remaining gap is what our efforts for test and treat are trying to reach. How do we treat our older patients? Um, I'm going to ask you, um, if you were to treat a patient with HIV who was 51 years old, what would you propose as their antiretroviral regimen? Okay. But what if they were 49? <laughs> but what if they were 18? <laughs> but what if they were 95? <laughs> so that's a great choice. And other choices could also then be our injectable agents as we move forward. But therapy does not change based on age, and the efficacy of it is expected to be the same. And that's made um, my clinic precepting. Um, <laughs> if, uh, if you ever tell me they're not on Victarvi, then I, I have to go back to the computer. <laughs> All right. Um, Remember that early antiretroviral therapy is really the most important thing for decreasing complications. There was a long time ago now, although it doesn't seem long ago to me, um, concern that early antiretroviral therapy exposed people to increased risk because our medications about 15 years ago were more toxic and more likely to exacerbate metabolic syndrome and cardiovascular effects. So there was a trial that was really a groundbreaking trial called the SMART trial, which looked at starting therapy in people with a CD4 count um, above 350 versus waiting until they dropped below 350 to even initiate therapy. And the hypothesis of the trial was people will do better if we wait because we'll avoid medication-related toxicity. And the finding of the trial was people did worse across death related to HIV disease as well as metabolic complications by withholding therapy. Because HIV itself is an inflammatory disease and the inflammatory processes of HIV have effects on cardiovascular systems renal systems, et cetera. So start early is clearly the answer regardless of anyone's age or other comorbidities. How many medications are your old HIV patients on? They are on a lot of them. Um, how many of you are happy when you're at the VA that there's pharmacy there to tell you what you're supposed to do? Very. I am. Um, I mean, sometimes actually the fellows present to the pharmacist and I just, <laughs> I just contribute. <laughs> right. <laughs> and I contribute a little bit. Um, but um, no when we're dealing with our older patients, they are on a lot of medications. And it is of vital importance in your geriatric patients to attend to polypharmacy. Um, many of the patients are at risk for major drug-drug interactions, and that can include impairing the efficacy of their antiretroviral regimen or exacerbating liver toxicities, renal toxicities, and a lot of other things. Um, it is vital for us as the ID specialists to be aware of the important drug interactions because the easiest thing we can do when an interaction check pops up is say, I am aware, and then click and order the medication. Um, 
that doesn't make the interaction go away. It just makes the alert go away. And so we need to be attending to whether we're making safe choices and communicating with our other specialists, oftentimes in cardiology, et cetera, about different medication choices that might be necessary because of those drug-drug interactions. Um, HIV medications can interact significantly with pulmonary medications, especially steroids. They can interact with um, erectile dysfunction drugs and lead to syncopal episodes. They can interact with other alpha blockers. They interact significantly with a lot of the antibiotics we give for other co-infections. They interact significantly oftentimes with anti-seizure medications or psychiatric medications. And those are the classes of medications you should be most mindful of when you see a patient taking them to at least say, this patient with comorbid schizophrenia or um, clotting disorder, et cetera, I need to look at what they're taking to make sure that this regimen is safe in conjunction. Um, in most cases, the other specialties will say, I defer to you because they say the HIV medication is the most important. Um, and you'll have to decide whether you have other options in your HIV regimen or whether it is more incumbent on them to change their regimen. There's a lot here, and I'm not gonna read it all to you, but when you look at these slides on your own, sometimes when you're doing the primary care with a patient, you need to not only look for interactions, but you need to look for ways that you can decrease their total medication regimen. And so this is a pretty detailed, algorithm for de-prescribing medication. And the gist of it is to look at evidence of whether a medication is necessary. If, it, if there's no evidence to support a medication's use, it's easy to de-prescribe it. Secondarily, you want to look at whether the medications are causing the patient significant adverse effects or side effects. Those are also things that could be either de-prescribed or decreased in dose if possible. And then ultimately you wanna look at what the patient's treatment goals are. They may be on medications meant to prevent a risk factor that they're no longer significantly concerned about anymore based on age. They may be on something to symptomatically control something that can be weaned away. And all of those are things that can help you to simplify the regimen um, because ultimately it is important for us to maintain the ongoing treatment with antiretrovirals um, ensure their efficacy as much as possible. And if other unnecessary medications can be taken out of that, it's a pretty helpful thing. Um, we often do that by asking the patient to bring in everything they're taking. I know we have a list of their medications on our computer systems. That's just what the computer says they're taking. Um, you want the patient, if you're really going to investigate their medication regimen, to bring it in look at what they're taking and say, you have eight bottles of this same medication. And they might say, yes, I take all eight of those. <laughs> uh, and so you need to know how are they functionally taking their medication, not just what the list says is there. At reconciliation. Yeah. I mean, it's right there on my uh, cosine of the note. I say we reconcile the medication. <laughs> all right. Um, in your older patients, these are some of the most important comorbidities you're going to be dealing with. One of them that is the squishiest is something called frailty. It's kind of a, you know it when you see it. Um, cardiovascular disease, very common in our HIV patients. Diabetes, renal disease, osteoporosis, and increasing levels of neurocognitive disorders. In that list, nearly all of them are slightly exacerbated by the presence of HIV, even with treatment. So what is frailty? Um, frailty is a patient that has new unintentional weight loss. They're exhausted for unclear reasons that you can't pin to a different medical diagnosis. They have slow gait speed. They might have weak, weak gait grip strength. And the things that can be more likely to predispose to that in our HIV patients are those who have been diagnosed for a long time, who have either a low current or low nadir CD4 count, people who are not virologically controlled, people who have co-infection with hep C, 
comorbid diabetes or kidney disease, um, or either a very low or high body mass index. All of those can make someone more prone to frailty. Frailty increases the risk of falls and increases the risk of significant malnutrition in our patient and can sometimes compromise their ability to live independently. One of the things we can do to assess that is to assess nutritional status. Luckily, with effective antiretroviral therapy, HIV wasting is a much less likely disorder, but now we will see wasting because people are getting older and frailty occurs in all of us, slightly accelerated in our HIV population. Um, it is very unlikely to be malnourished if you are what we refer to as a free living elderly person. So if you have access to pasture, can walk around and you're not caged, you'll be fine. But if you are institutionalized um, or unable to, um, outside of a nursing home or assisted living, your risk of malnutrition is much higher. Your risk of malnutrition goes up if you have any interaction with acute care hospitalization and any of those transitions of care. And those are times that we may be seeing a patient coming out of those transitions of care that we should assess their nutritional status to make sure we're optimizing that as well. How do you do that? Well, in most cases, if you have the privilege of being in a multi-specialty clinic and healthcare system, you ask for a nutrition consult and they can assess based on the patient's weight and um, caloric intake, whether they are malnourished or at risk for malnutrition. Um, if they are assessed to be significantly at risk, um, you probably need to prescribe them nutritional supplementation, things like Booster and Sure or other things. And for people who fall into a malnourished criteria, those are prescription medications that are covered by their insurance. If they don't and just say, I really like to have Boost with breakfast, then they just have to buy that at the pharmacy. But um, usually for those that I think get to a BMI less than 18.5, you can prescribe a, a nutritional supplementation to help decrease that risk. Um, one of the other things we talked about with frailty is impaired mobility. Um, as your patients come in, you can do a gross assessment of their mobility. Are they walking easily? Are they <coughs> not? But for those who you're concerned about their mobility, one of the quickest tests we do is something called a timed up and go test. Um, and the timed up and go test um, can tell us whether this patient might need assistance with physical therapy or other assistive walking devices because of their impaired mobility. How do you do this test? So you ask the patient to sit in a chair 10 feet away from whatever mark you've made. You get a stopwatch, or if you don't have a stopwatch because no one has stopwatches, you just use your phone or you count to 10 in your head. You ask them to walk 10 feet away. Well, get up from the chair, walk 10 feet away, turn around and come back. And if they use a cane or a walker, you, they can use that device with, with that assistance. But if they're able to do that in um, 12 seconds or less, they have intact mobility. If it takes them longer than that, then they have impaired mobility and you want to get them some extra assistance. So these are quick things you can do in clinic to sort of assess those risks as well. Um, as I said, one of the bigger things we face is cardiovascular risk in our HIV patients. And um, one of the greatest places to study big populations is in the VA hospital system because we have the most data about them. And so one of the big aging cohort studies was the veterans aging cohort. Um, and it showed that patients with HIV had a higher risk of myocardial infarction in that large cohort than those without HIV. Um, it was because of traditional risk factors. It was because of metabolic alterations because of their medications. And it seemed to, even if you controlled for both of those, be related to that pro-inflammatory state caused by HIV itself. So all of those play a role. Um, this is some of the 
general data they saw across age groups, and this was the um, adjusted risk. You can see that if you were HIV positive across all of these age groups, your risk of myocardial infarction was, um, in some cases, almost double that of a non-HIV infected individual. What that means for us is we have to be attentive to those risk factor modification strategies. What's the most important risk factor you can modify for your HIV patients? Smoking. So if you had a patient who came in and their viral load was 49 and their blood pressure was 142 over 90 and their LDL was 120 and they were a smoker and they said, I only have one minute and then I'm going to leave. <laughs> they do that. What do you want to do? You want to get them to quit smoking. That's the most powerful impact you can have on that patient. Are any of your patients confused? <laughs> yeah. Um, sometimes it's confusing because we don't know what we're talking about and we just confuse them. But sometimes they are confused because they have cognitive dysfunction. HIV causes and is linked to minor cognitive deficits compared to age match cohorts. Minor cognitive deficits can be very difficult to discern and you probably need to do comprehensive neurocognitive batteries to determine those. That might be the difference between someone who was well-versed in British literature and now is having a harder time understanding it, or was a great piano player and isn't as good at it anymore. What we'll be more likely to be able to recognize are when people develop true dementia diagnoses, comorbid with their HIV. And again, for all of the same reasons that they have cardiovascular risk, they have vascular risk for cognition as well. Um, the easiest ways for us to screen for this are with regular screening tools. Um, the most effective of the cognitive screening tools is called the MOCA or the Montreal Cognitive Assessment. Um, a score below, I think, about 25 out of 30 on that test is indicative of potential cognitive loss, and that patient should be referred for further neurocognitive testing. You can also do some blood work on the patients, although in most cases, imaging or laboratory assessment doesn't really help you with dementia diagnosis. But sometimes someone who is hypothyroid could have cognitive loss, and you can easily reverse that. B12 deficiency can sometimes lead to cognitive loss as well. And our favorite cause of cognitive loss Neurosyphilis could be a cause as well. So if they've never had an RPR, you can always get one. You get one, you ask them, have you ever been treated for syphilis? And you're asking that of a patient who you think is demented. And so, and right, right. <laughs> so you're probably going to end up uh, uh, treating for syphilis. Um, MRI can be helpful if you're looking for vascular dementia. Sometimes you can see signs of many strokes. And if for some reason you think maybe they have a, a, a prion disease, um, you might be able to recognize that as well through an MRI. Um, don't do that. Um, but if you do, and radiology says, why are you getting an MRI? Um, if you say that, you might throw them off for a, a whole day. That's um, do we ever do DEXA scans for our HIV patients? Why do we do that? So, so, yeah. Um, for those of you at Tampa General, the crowd here murmured words. Um, so we do <laughs> DEXA scans because our HIV patients are at risk for bone mineral density loss. Why? Because they have HIV and because the medications we give them can also exacerbate that. <clears throat> um, if you were to judge... Um, the older version of tenofovir versus the newer version of tenofovir for bone mineral density risk. Is the older one worse or is the newer one worse? Both one is better, but it yeah. uses the cardioprotective effects. 
Well, the newer one is definitely better for bone mineral density thing. Um, I don't know about the cardiovascular stuff. Is that true? All right. Good. So definitely the um, TAF is better for bones and will tolerate it for cardiovascular right now because the one thing we can do for most of the cardiovascular things is modify those risk factors with other therapies. And we don't have a lot to do for bone mineral density except mm -hmm. give much more complex medications. So indications for bone mineral density testing, there's a lot of standard ones, mostly related to age, postmenopausal status, low body weight, smoking, and secondary osteoporosis risk. Um, I'm going to name some things and you can tell me whether you think they cause their secondary risk factor for osteoporosis. Hyperthyroidism, rheumatoid arthritis. What are we talking about today? HIV. Yes, so it is one as well. So these are all the secondary causes of secondary osteoporosis in adults. It's exhausting. So what I point to is the one in the top right corner that says HIV AIDS. And if you're taking care of a patient with HIV AIDS, you can say that's one of them. And then you can help to do the rest of your calculations. So does every HIV patient need screen for osteoporosis? Like your 19 year old who was just recently diagnosed and you put on TAF a day ago? No. So what has been helpful is um, a US and European team together made some protocols to help drive our DEXA screening utilization for our HIV patients. So if you are an adult with HIV, you can be in one of two categories. You've already had a fracture or you haven't had a fracture. If you've already had a fracture, that's a pretty good sign that you might have osteoporosis. And so you can screen with DEXA to get a sense of their um, Z scores and prescribe appropriately. If you're dealing with a patient who has never had an osteoporotic fracture, usually these are going to be either vertebral compression fractures, wrist fractures, or hip fractures. If they're less than 40, we don't do anything unless something else in that workup would have prompted it. If they are a male patient from 40 to 49 or a premenopausal woman greater than 40 years old, we don't do a DEXA unless the FRAX score indicates a significant risk. And then for men greater than 50 or postmenopausal women, we should do DEXA scans. So when we talked about that curve of geriatric patients we're dealing with, most of our patients probably need screen now because so many of our patients are over 50. But for your younger patients in that 40 to 49 year old age group, the best way to determine whether they need screened is by using the FRAX algorithm. Have any of you used this before? Okay. So I won't click on it here, but if you get the slides at some point, you can use this tool. The FRAX score includes data about the patient's age, smoking, alcohol use, whether or not they have a risk for secondary osteoporosis, height and weight, et cetera, and gender, and even geographic location, because that plays a role. Um, it also has a place to insert bone mineral density. But of course, if you're using this to try to determine whether to measure their bone mineral density, you don't have that data. So you just leave it blank. And if you have a patient who, with those basic calculations, has a risk for major osteoporotic fracture of greater than 10%, then they should be screened with a, um, a DEXA scan. If they are less than that in that younger age group, you can just wait. And that's all of that there. There's some more if you want, but those are really the main um, issues you have when to screen and how to do it. I have trouble with when to rescreen or when to protect yeah. that. I have an abnormal one. Yeah, so the guidelines there are very shady. Yeah. Um, 
probably every year isn't necessary unless you had someone who was already getting close. Like if if you screen someone who was 40 and they weren't even osteopenic, you can wait two or three years. If they were mid-level osteopenia, you probably want to screen them again. Um, and probably a year is okay. Right. Um, last things we wanted to talk about is just um, general life expectancy. And what we tend to see now is that life expectancy in our HIV patients comparable to age match cohorts. Even with all these other risks we talked about, because most of these patients are linked to care, their risks are being managed probably better than the general population. Um, but people still, th this is a, I, I don't want to make anyone sad, but this might make you sad. People are more likely to die the older they get. And now our data with HIV patients shows that the older you are, the more likely you are to die. That's really not bad news. That's good news for our management of HIV is that more people die when they're old and not more people dying when they're young. Um, remember, in all of those groups, you also need to keep on doing the same things you would for um, preventive services task force screening. So age-appropriate colonoscopies, age-appropriate um, pap smears and HPV screening, um, and rectal paps for our HIV-infected individuals who um, engage in uh, risk behavior. High-resolution CT scans for patients who are smokers. All of those are still going to play an important role in our outcomes. And if you're doing all of those, you're going to keep those trends the same as we've seen, where our HIV patients live the same life expectancy as others, but have to have those risk factors managed more exquisitely than someone else might. And with that, I'll take any questions you have, but 